Have you ever wondered how to do research when you write a blog optimized for SEO? Well, if that's you, you landed in the right video because today in this video, you learn from a six figure content writer. And I coach freelance writers and help them to find uh, clients. And um, this is our special guest today. And she's going to talk about um, uh, research. She's going to help you with, with research. And awesome. Well, hi, everyone. I am super grateful to Franciele for inviting me, first of all. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to say it wasn't that long ago that I was a newbie freelance writer as well. I'm currently uh, almost three full years into my journey, which is super exciting. Mm -hmm. And to look back and think, I started writing on a little tablet with a little Bluetooth keyboard. And now I have, you know, my own home office. So it's like been a really big journey. And I also own an LLC now. So basically, long story short, I'm all in. And it's been wonderful. And I hope that, you know, something great happens for you all as well. It's been three years since I started. The end of this year will be three years since I got my very first client on Fiverr. I no longer work through Fiverr anymore, but it was great for getting my business off of the ground. I have been in professional writing for about five or six years. So I was familiar with the industry before I did jump in. Mm -hmm. And that does make a difference, but you don't necessarily have to be coming from professional writing or journalism in order to succeed. There's so much to write about. So I'm excited yeah, to for talk sure. about some things that I hope will improve that writing and make you more valuable to clients. Yes. For I'll switch to my next slide here. These are just some high level SEO tips. So if you are someone who knows about SEO, understands the concept of what search engine optimization is, but isn't really sure how to implement it, these would be helpful. Something that I come across in my daily SEO writing is that you don't necessarily need to avoid high search topics that are highly competitive, but you can write about more niche topics within those that broader umbrella. You'll find lower competition keywords, and sometimes those keywords are longer than five words, which usually means it's a long tail keyword. Those are searched less often, but they're also less competitive, which means like the big sites and the featured snippets on the search engine results page aren't already taken and you have more of a chance of entering into that position. Um, I guess an example I could give with that is um, I was writing about some financial industry news today about a company called Activision Blizzard that is being sued out the wazoo. And uh, that's not wh what's really important, but there's a lot of news about Activision Blizzard, just that keyword, the company name. However, I wrote about will Activision Blizzard stock delist from the stock exchange so that's a more specific question within the broader category, and that has a higher likelihood to rank on the first page of Google. Um, I did mention those snippets and those high domain authority sites. So when you search a keyword, including a long tail keyword, you know, you always want to search it first to see what shows up on the search engine results page. Uh, snippets are those things that are like the different features that a uh, search engine results page might have. Um, I will show you some examples down the line, but usually it's just a way for the Google algorithm to provide more value and help you get your answers quicker. Uh, a domain authority or a high domain authority website is just a website that has been linked to you know, tons of times. And a lot of people know it by name. It's more of a household name. Uh, coming If you're coming from a lower domain authority site, site, you might not be quite as competitive against, 
you know, in my industry, it's websites like Investopedia or, you know, Market Beat, the really big news sites or the New York Times, things like that. Uh, oh, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, do you know if, because I know, uh, I think Instagram was going to partner with, because I think LinkedIn already is a searchable for SEO. Do you know if it's it's already on, like it, uh, link, uh, Instagram um, being like searchable on for SEO, Instagram well, uh, captions? I like to think, um, well, so social media, I don't think that social media shows up directly on search engine results page yet. You can get profiles though, I believe, but actual posts, I don't think so. Um, which is why I think people treat each of those platforms as what I call micro search engines. Um, and you can optimize, you know, a LinkedIn page or a LinkedIn profile with specific keywords, but I don't think that they have developed to show actual social media posts on uh, search engine results pages quite yet. I could be mistaken, but I haven't encountered that. So um, this third point here on the high level SEO tips, there are two ways to go about choosing a topic for your next blog um, or for a company's next blog. You can either choose the topic that you want to write about first and then find keywords within that frame. So for example, say you want to write about the benefit. I'm just about to start working with a personal loan brand. So this is kind of top of, top of mind right now. So you could either say, I want to write about uh, bad debt and then choose great keywords within that topic. Or you can find, you know, great keywords within the greater industry and then choose specific topics based on the keywords that show up within your research. So there's kind of two ways to go about it. And they're kind of the reverse of each other. But I think if you use a hybrid of the two, you'll have a great strategy moving forward. Another thing, just adding in there, you won't always be asked to choose the topics for, for your client's work, but some clients don't wanna spend the time to come up with topics. And you can offer that as a value proposition as well. And that will also increase the price of your content. Um, so I do have a simple three-step process for blog keyword research. You could use other tools than the ones that I'm sharing, but I think that for beginners and these, you know, quote unquote, newbie writer community, and even for people like me who are really just offering basic keyword research, it's definitely enough. So the first one is Google ads. Now people get Google ads accounts when you know, maybe they own a brand and they want to start running ads on Google search engine results pages. However, you can make a free Google ads account and then never once make an ad, which is what I do, and simply go into their keyword planner tool and use it to find keywords. Uh, basically, what you do is you'll go to ads.google.com, make an account set it up, uh, log in, you'll find this homepage and there is a menu item called tools and settings right here. And then you'll go under planning and use keyword planner. That's honestly the only tool I've ever used on Google ads. So I can't tell you what the rest you of the site it? does. But you it's free, right? What was that? You said it's free to create yeah, this. It's, a free, it's definitely free. Yeah. I've never had to pay anything for it. So if you ever wanted to run actual ads through the platform, you would have to, of course, pay. But um, the keyword planner itself is free. And so, yeah, like I said, go to tools and settings, keyword Just planner. Let me interrupt you for a sec. Hey, guys, if you're watching this on live, please uh, uh Comment below hashtag live. If you're watching on replay, comment hashtag replay because what that does is just it just helps uh, people, more people view it. M maybe people that forgot. So please uh, help help us out. So comment below hashtag live if you're watching it now. 
Uh, and if you're watching on replay, comment hashtag replay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, Rachel. Of course. No worries. So I showed you this, uh, how to get to the keyword planner. Now let's look at the actual keyword planner. I just took a screenshot here because I think it shows everything that you really need to see. Like I said, I had just gotten off the phone with a new personal loan industry client yesterday when I was making this. Um, so that was kind of what was in my head. Basically, you enter the keyword here. You can enter multiple keywords as well or variations of keywords. You just separate them by a comma. I just did one here to show you kind of basically how it works. You enter the keyword. You get a bunch of results. This is just like above the fold. The can results you see. Because it? it's too small. Let's see here. Um. I can see you can zoom it. Yeah. Okay. I'm using. Yeah. Fortunately, I have a touch screen, so that actually makes it a little. Yeah, bit I, I think it's better like that. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah. Oh, great. Yes. I can do it on the full Much screen better. as well. All so things. basically, you see here, um, you end up with some keywords, and one of them is, for example, uh, personal loans for bad credit and upstart loans. I clicked those because you look at things like average monthly searches. Um, three month change. Sometimes there's breakout keywords that are suddenly more popular because of, you know, events in the world. Like, for example, I'm sure the word COVID was a breakout keyword in early 2020 because, you know, people hadn't been using that word before. Um, you can see the year over year change. And this one's really important to, let's see here. Um, I think I need to exit up. Um, the competition, you can either be low, medium, or high. You typically want to avoid only using high keyword, high competition keywords, just because it's harder to rank for those. The two I picked are medium. You could also mix it with some low competition. Definitely, you can use three to five keywords. I would say no more than five for sure, but three is probably ideal. And you can use some of those keywords for um, subheadings in your blogs to help improve the optimization. So you'll have your primary keyword, which will most likely some mo most likely be in your title in some variation. And then you'll have your secondary keywords, which you implement maybe in subheadings or in the body of your content. Is that a rule for how many subheadings you should have in a blog to make it a good blog? There's really not a hard and fast rule. I would say my, it depends, first of all, how long your blog is. And uh, you don't want to put too much text under one subheading because it'll kind of come across as like intimidating to read, mm -hmm. like a big block of text. So you might want to use uh, H3 subheadings under those H2 subheadings to help break that up. For example, like in 500 word articles that I write, I might use, you know, three to four subheadings. Mm -hmm. um, in a thousand word articles, it might be more like six, you know, six or seven. Wow. I do think that more subheadings are better than just having really minimal subheadings just because it directs the reader. Yeah. And it also is good for SEO because mm -hmm. I don't know if you uh, noticed how you can go to Google, type something in, and it'll take you to a specific part of a blog. Yes. And then yeah. it'll highlight that section. And then mm -hmm. it'll have like the super long URL until you click away from the highlight. Yeah. So that. Those subheadings and definitely help direct readers, but also direct Google to show readers. Um, is there anything else, Franciella, you think I should cover on this screenshot here, or did I? I answer? think I think that's fine for me. Oh, sorry. yeah, because the other stuff is really only. I mean, you see these prices here. You can ignore that. Those are for people who want to use something called pay-per-click advertising, which basically means like you pay 
this much money every time someone clicks on your ad that shows up for that keyword. So that has nothing to do with what we're doing. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a really helpful tool. It's free, like I said. So, you know, you can charge more and also not be spending more at the same yeah. time. What, what tool do you personally use to avoid uh, what's called when you copy and paste something from someone? I, I, for, I forgot the word in English. Plagiarism. Yeah, plagiarism. What do you personally use that you want to recommend to, to the people watching? So I have, I have some resources at the end, so I will dig into that. Um, okay. I would say you... I never, ever have a problem with plagiarism because if it's, you know, in quotes and it's attributed and it's just a little a couple of sentences, you're, you're fine. As long as you're sourcing correctly um, and usually good blogs include a lot of sources. So when you are mixing all of those resources together into your own unique resource, you're really not going to have a problem with it. Um but I, like I said, I do have a couple of resources uh, that can help with plagiarism and also grammar at the end. So I will dig into that. Sure. Thank you. Of course. Um, one moment. The second tool I use for my keyword research is called answerthepublic.com. This is a pretty cool tool. Um, it's, you can get two free searches per day. So I would say, you know, stick with high level keywords, one per blog. So say you're writing like two SEO blogs during the day, then you're good. If you write more than that, you might need to supplement this with other tools just because it's a great tool, but it's super expensive if you end up having to pay for it. So I would just stick with the two free searches per day and use like one search per blog that you wanna write and definitely make the most of the search. Um, I'll show you what it looks like when you do search something. So I use the personal loan example again. You basically search and it tells you all the questions that people are asking about personal loans and it gives you who, what, why, when, blah, 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 blah. <gasps> it's really interesting. And this is actually just, you know, a little bit of what it gives. It also gives uh, other types of questions like prepositional questions, comparison questions. So like personal loan versus uh, bank loan, something like that, you know? See, it's always like the work of a writer. It's incredible because you have everything ready for you. you just have to put them together basically for the client because they don't have, of course you have to research and put them together to to the client because they don't have time to make that because look at that like we have everything today all the tools google yeah. makes it easier for us right right so this tool is so interesting to me because i mean questions can be keywords uh or like these are great examples of long tail keywords they're usually like five or more words and um they're full sentences basically. So you can actually, when you do go on the tool, you can actually click directly on each of these and it takes you to the search results for that specific question. So it makes the research a little bit easier. And, you know, I just, I like to use this especially to get ideas for subheadings. So if I was writing about personal loans, I might say. Can you well, zoom in a bit too? Please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And also, uh, is there any question there that is like they have a percentage? Like those questions are ninety percent asked. Then those are thirty percent. Like, does it have a rating? I think they put the ones at the top that are more common, and then like there's a bunch of sections at the bottom with like less common ones. Mm -hmm. You might have to cross check it with Google Ads to see exactly how popular things are, though. Um. So, for example, like you're looking over here, you might say, well, a personal loan hurt my credit. Like that could be a great sub heading for a bigger, longer article about personal loans in general. Um, why did your personal loan get rejected? You know, maybe mm -hmm. if someone wants, got, just got a rejection and doesn't know why, and they'll be taking directly to that. 
So you just kind of look around at the different questions and have fun with Answer the Public. I would say get familiar with it. Get familiar with these tools in general before you actually have to use them. So that way you can confidently say to a client, yes, I've got tools on hand. Like I can do SEO research for you and, you know, we'll make this happen. Mm -hmm. um, and amazing. thank you. Of course. I think everyone probably knows this, but the third step for blog keyword research is just to go to Google. A Google SERP is just the search engine results page. It's just a little bit easier to say. Um, just look through the first 10 results. You can see here, um, this is a type of featured snippet people also ask. And there's probably like four different websites that got linked here if you open them up. This was a good example because this was something I wrote about recently um, in a subheading. I wrote about like the larger, what is the metaverse? And it was, I talked about the blockchain, which is if you're familiar with cryptocurrency, it has to do with that. And it was interesting because the first results here are not like, I mean, the Bloomberg article is big, but it's not really answering exactly what I'm asking. Coindesk is another big platform, but again, it's really not like exactly what I'm asking. And then the following uh, sources are not huge ones that I've heard of before. So there's definitely room to weasel into that, those top results there, if you do create something that answers that question directly. Um, and I guess just going back to this real quick, a lot of it, you know, does have to do with data. Like how, how often is this getting searched? What are people specifically asking? But a lot of keyword research has to do with intuition as well. Um, you're someone who Googles every day, I'm sure everybody is. So what do, when you're asking a question, what is your intent behind that question? And what are you hoping to find? Use that you know, perspective as well. Mm -hmm. um, I gave this example of content that recently ranked for me. I don't really keep track of all my ranking content, but I just happened to stumble upon this like two days ago. So I threw that in there. Um, this was an article I wrote for one of my clients. It's an investing app similar to Robinhood. And you can see here, it's below the featured snippet, but it's still pretty high up and pretty likely to get clicked on. What's the keyword that he uh, researched the app there so people can do it? Yeah, so the keyword was is Tops IPO. Tops is a company that sells like trading cards or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you click here, I'll show you the actual article. So this is just like the desk version of public.com like I said some beginner usually I have my intro shorter than this but this one just happened to be a bit longer there's always a too long didn't read section mm -hmm. um, where I kind of break down the top key points sometimes I throw in related articles as well just to keep people reading and you have not only these subheads try to use things like bullet points to make it a little bit easier to read and uh, short paragraphs. Um, more subheadings, more bullet points, you know. Uh, it's not necessarily a pattern, but I just try to break up the text to make it yeah. more engaging. And then there was, on these types of articles, there's always a bottom line with the book. A conclusion. Um, so aside from keyword research for SEO, part of being a great SEO blog writer is writing well and writing quickly. So, so I think something that I'm good at is writing quickly, and that has definitely helped me just have a little bit more breathing room in my day <laughs> um, as far as work life balance goes. Not necessarily as clients, but more importantly, it helps me keep my sanity. Um, yeah, for well, sure. <laughs> 
So the majority of my clients, I would like to say, are clients who I've been working with for a while. And the benefit of that is that I know exactly what they're looking for. I, you know, know what the tone of voice they want is. I know what not to say and what to say. Usually there's some sort of regular formatting that you can stick to. So it's like second nature. I would say when you're chasing clients, look for clients who could potentially be long-term clients that come back to you every month, but preferably, you know, every week or more. And yeah, that's that's what I said in the last life. Yeah. It's just like saving time on marketing. No one wants to be spending more time marketing than actually writing. So (laughs) Yeah, like when you were look for, looking for a project, like that's the th- third level of conversation you should have as a client, like as an entrepreneur, like what's the potential of be working with that client again? You know, usually if they if they if their needs are blog posts or email marketing, if they are serious about investing in those, uh, you are going, to, if they like you, they're going to keep you and they're going to be long-term project because they need it blog posts weekly if they want to give to keep you know giving value to their audience and making money they need to yeah. keep it and it's stressful for clients to keep finding new writers like they don't want to be doing that so you know be that beacon of light that makes it easy for them too yeah for sure um in the same vein i think that really honing your formatting your document formatting and using outlines will also make your writing better and faster. Combined with long-term clients, you'll be pumping out content more often than you thought you would. I think that, you know, even if you're someone who doesn't think you need to use an outline, I would say just give it a try. And what I mean by that is start by creating a template in Google Docs. I use Google Docs. You could use Word if you want, but I think Google Docs is a little bit more beneficial and shareable, of course. So uh, fill in things that you'll need to fill out for every blog. So make a table, for example, that says keywords. Fill that in when when you make a new blog. Metadata, I can talk about that in a second. Title, um, subheadings. When you're ready to make the outline, you can add specific subheadings add in sources under each of those subheadings. So you can just go back and fill in information from those different sources. And then eventually you can actually fill out the content and be done really quickly. I think this is super important because like I said, it just makes your content make more sense. A lot of times the thought processes we have in our head aren't, you know, like, sensical or linear. Sometimes we just come to uh, information in a non-linear way and creating these outlines basically ensures that you're sharing information in the most effective way. Because content writing, no matter what you're writing about, you're sharing information and teaching people something. So by using those outlines, uh, you're just making that process a little bit easier. So I mentioned something called metadata, and that that has to do with SEO as well. If you're unfamiliar with that, it's basically when you go to a search engine results page, you see a title for the article, and you see a short description of what you might read. Sometimes Google chooses those descriptions themselves. Other times, people will specifically identify a sentence that they want to show in that section. And usually on things like WordPress or whatever content management system you're using, there's a place to implement a meta description, which is the little one sentence description that I mentioned, and also a meta title or an SEO title, which is usually like a shorter version or a more SEO friendly version of your regular title, your main title. So when you're doing SEO, you usually wanna provide like a regular title and then an extra SEO optimized title (laughs) for clickable purposes. 
And then that meta description using the keywords that you identified from your keyword research. Um, Franciella, do you think I, do you have any questions about that section or do you think people will have questions about that? Uh, I think I'm, I'm fine because I'm not too, I, I, I did more copywriting, so I, I don't understand fully a lot of SEO. That's why I want you to come in and because I love, I, a lot of people in the community, they want to know about SEO and keyword research. So I think that, mm -hmm. uh, but if they do have questions, they will put it, uh, they will comment afterwards. Because like I said, a lot of people are, will be watching on replay. Um, so yeah, and if you are available, if you're, uh, if you're available to answer, um, but if you guys also know, there is quite a small percentage, mostly writers on the group, but if you are an entrepreneur and if you are looking for an SEO writer in the finance industry, what, which, what, what are the other industries you write for, finance? Uh, I mostly do finance and investing. However, I do write about the environment and uh, I do some digital marketing writing as well. Okay, yeah. So if, if you are looking for a SEO writer, uh, talk to Rachel. She's in the group. Uh, and yeah, I think that's, I don't have any questions, so you can move on. Awesome. I, I do have the questions for the, uh, of the people later on. We can. Uh, okay, yeah, we'll get to that. Let, no worries. I just wanted to make sure I was describing that well. So these are just examples of content. This is a specific uh, type of content for a public that usually has a very specific format, which allows me to write it really fast. It's another of those IPO pieces, initial public offerings, just something in finance. Again, the TLDR, which like I said, means too long, didn't read, super helpful section. The, this type of article always has a quick history of the company. This one's Fabletics, if you've heard of it. Uh, fundraising, corporate fundraising, Path to the IPO, when is the IPO date, risks and opportunities and in investing, and bottom line. And every single IPO article is like that. I write a, a lot of other types of articles for this company, but I think this is just a great example because there's a pretty standard format for all of them. And it really helps me, you know, write more quickly and shows exactly, you know, how that outline went into play. So something I wrote yesterday, if you've heard of Casper Sleep, they were a public company. They are no longer a public comp company for much longer. Uh, so my first sentence was, as Casper Sleep customers the world over snooze on their beloved mattresses, the company behind the slumber is shutting the lights on its public stock. And then I kind of go into, you know, what's going on? Why are they going private? They just had their IPO and see all these subheadings here. I also embedded some tweets, which I th think is sometimes a good thing to get the conversation going. So those are just a couple examples of brief, relevant, and, you know, mildly clever intros. They're not all, you're not always gonna write a fantastic intro, but I really think it's worth trying. Um, and then I go to some resources. The first one that I think is super helpful for newbie writers is something called HubSpot Academy. I love it. Yeah. I've learned so much. Yeah. It's all free classes. I mean, literally, it doesn't cost a dime. You can search their library. Say they have free course, though, because I've seen it. I was like, why they give so much free courses? Does they have any paid courses that they can upsell people? Uh, they have software that they make money off of, I believe. Okay. So. Oh, I have, yeah, I think that they really try to use this as a value proposition for their software, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, there, there are SEO courses there uh, and even email copywriting courses, guys, if you whatever you want to specialize and, and, and provide to your client, go there because it's helpful. I've, I've seen it and I've learned from it, too. Yeah, there's really all kinds, not just SEO content writing, but. You can see here they have a certification course for learning all things SEO, including web optimization, link building, keyword research, all that jazz. This is a full certificate, so it take, probably takes a little bit longer, maybe like eight or so hours. But 
there is courses that you can take in a couple of hours time. So I think my back button doesn't want to work. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, basically I would say just take the time to browse. There's a content marketing certification course, email marketing, all kinds of stuff. It's just really great. In my opinion, I've taken a few of them, probably going to take another one this winter when I'm not working. So Sure. I do have questions about the audience. Uh, so let me pull them up here. One, I didn't quite understand his question from, um, um, I forgot his name here, but his question is, any programs needed to implement SEO in my writing? So I guess you showed all the tools. I guess that's what he meant. So there are some tools that you can actually have, like review your content. Um, and tell you exactly like, is your keyword density high enough? Once you start doing it enough, it kind of becomes like second nature, I think. But you can use tools like, uh, if, for example, if you have WordPress and are writing on WordPress, there's a plugin called Yoast. Mm -hmm. um, that is Y-O-A-S-T. And that kind of helps you identify where a keyword should go. There's also something uh, called SEMrush. S-E-M-R-U-S-H, SEMrush. Mm -hmm. I'm not super sure about all the pricing for like, I know if you're an enterprise company using SEMrush, it's going to cost you like a couple hundred bucks. But if you're just an individual, I'm not super sure. Like if, I think there are some free tools and then like some stuff you might have to pay for. Um, and then also, I guess I realized I forgot to put this into the presentation, but uh, grammar tools like Hemingway and yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Hemingway is really helpful. It tells you what grade level you're writing at. Honestly, most content marketing writing is like a middle school grade level reading comprehension, <laughs> which yes. is good because you don't want to confuse people. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So the other question that I got here is which free from Roxanne, which free keyword resor uh, research tool do you consider to be the best? So I think Google ads is probably the best uh, just because you can endlessly search all day long and it never costs you any money. Uh, you can also search different variations of keywords and then look to the Google SERP to see how it's performing in real time mm -hmm. um, and find out where those entries are. So I think Google ads is definitely a great place to start. Okay. Well, this was so great. Thank you so much. And uh, guys, do you have any questions? So type your questions right now. So speak now or hold on to your piece until we have comments. <laughs> um, so type, type in now. And uh, before we end this, uh, please comment hashtag live if you watch this live, hashtag replay if you watch that on replay. And I just want to mention, uh, I have Four more spots left if you want. If you need assistance in, you know, lending clients, know how to get into a sales call or closing a client on a DM. If that's something you're struggling, I'm taking three more people or four more people, and we can chat about more if you're the right fit to work together with me. But if not, uh, let me see here if people type in any more questions. I don't see any more questions, but I promise that it will come up because a lot of people will watch on replay this. Um, For sure, but, yeah. You can always yeah. comment on the the recording and just tag me or something and say, hey, you're also more than welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. I try to have a pretty big LinkedIn presence and it's it has come in handy. I've gotten a few inbound leads, which means yeah. people find me on LinkedIn, ask to work together, and then it, you know, it's pretty much no effort on my end. So I would definitely recommend getting on LinkedIn. Yes, connect with Rachel, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. This is, was awesome. I love it. And thank you so much for giving value. So um, we'll look forward to the questions afterwards because a lot of people say they want to watch the recording. And if you need anything, I'm here. And you are such a great addition to the community. And I hope that we can connect soon. Of course. Thank it was you. so awesome to get on here and talk. And even for myself, kind of, you know, look back and think all the stuff I've learned. Like, you are going to learn so much as a content writer, more than you ever would working as an employee at a company. You know, being a freelancer really 
kind of puts you on a fast track to becoming an expert in something. So yes, I'm excited yes. for you all. <laughs> yes. Have a great day, everybody. And type your questions and hashtag live and hashtag replay. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.